In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Team Grace, right now we're in ordinary time. And we're also in a National Eucharistic Revival here in the United States. In honor of both the summons of ordinary time to examine our discipleship, to ask hard questions, as well as the summons given by the National Eucharistic Revival, here at Our Lady of Grace for our homilies, we are walking through two main things. First, the parts of the Mass. And then secondly, aspects of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We're walking through the parts of the Mass in order for us to understand what are we supposed to be doing? What's happening during the different parts of worship? How can we actively participate in this worship? How can we let our hearts be united to the heart of Christ as he offers worship to the Father? So we're walking through the different parts of the Mass. We're also walking through the different parts of the Catechism of the Catholic Church because this is a great gift given to us that we might know the teachings of Christ in the church. We don't have to play guessing games. We are the children of God. We're not orphans. The Lord God has given us a lamp unto our feet in the midst of darkness. We don't have to stumble in the darkness as the unbeliever. We have light given to us. So we're walking through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So now let's continue then our walk through the Mass. So far up until last week, we were in the introductory rites of the Mass. So the whole first part of the Mass are called the introductory rites. What's that called? Wow, you guys are so good, huh? So all those parts that we've talked about so far are just the introductory rites. The whole goal of the introductory rites are to prepare us for worship. So we come in, we have a song, we venerate the altar, there's the open the sign of the cross, there's a greeting, the penitential rite, then we of course have the Gloria, we praise God, and then we have the opening collect. All those are the introductory rites. We get ready for worship. We repent of our sins. We receive the minor absolution. We give praise to God. We declare our intention for this worship. And then we see what Mother Church has given to us as a petition for this particular Mass. I hope that today you offered an intention for this Mass. That as a baptized Christian, you exercise the authority given to you in Jesus Christ, and you offered this sacrifice for someone. I also hope that you're able to come early. Remember, if we're going to get the most out of Mass, we have to start getting in the habit of coming to Mass early. We have to prepare for worship. This is the most important thing we do all week. It is worthy of preparation. It is worthy of whatever sacrifices we have to make in order to get here to prepare. And I know many of you have, and I'm grateful. I hope that you're able to come early and look at the opening collect. What was the petition of Mother Church for today's Mass? Do you know what's powerful, dear friends? Is that opening collect, that is prayed all throughout the world by all believers, the entire church militant on earth. That means the entire church is praying for each one of you. And what was the petition of the church for each one of us today? Did you catch it? True freedom. That we would be blessed as Christians with true freedom. That we would not fall into the slavery of sin or the lies of sin. That we would not be enslaved to fear or anxiety that we would not be enslaved to the fallen ideologies and worldviews of this world, that we would be free in Jesus Christ. We would claim the inheritance won for us in Jesus Christ, that we would be truly free. That was the petition prayed for each one of us, the opening collect. All that, again, is the opening, the introductory uh, rites. They prepare us for worship. So what's the first part of the Mass? Come on, we can do it a little more boldly, aren't we Catholics and Christians? Huh? What's the first part of the Mass? There you are. I knew you were out there. The introductory rites. The second part of the Mass we're, we're moving into now is called the Liturgy of the Word. Four words, Liturgy of the Word. Right? So what's the second part of the Mass? The Liturgy of the Word. Exactly. The first part of the Mass? The introductory And once again, the second part of the Mass? The Liturgy of the Word. Okay, Team Grace. And what we want to do now is just talk about what is the goal of the Liturgy of the Word. For the next several weeks, we're going to walk through the different parts of the Liturgy of the Word and how we can actively participate in these parts of the Mass. But first, we just need to understand, what is this part of the Mass all about? Well, first, we can go back to history. It's interesting to go to our roots. You know, in the early church, we were all Jewish Christians. We would all still go to synagogue. And then after synagogue, we would go into someone's home. One of the families of the, of the congregation would welcome the presbyter, the priest, and everyone else to come to their home. And then we would celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the third part of the Mass. So we'd go to synagogue, and then we'd go to the home, and we'd celebrate the Eucharist. Well, in 70 AD, we were excommunicated from the synagogue. The synagogue leadership said, look, you can't say Jesus is God and still be a Jewish person. Right? 
So they said, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to leave. So that began the formalization of our worship. And what we did is we just took the synagogue and we just merged it into our worship. Which is why if you look at the liturgy of the word and synagogue worship, there is a shocking parallel. Now our Lord practiced what was called Second Temple Judaism. That's different than Judaism today. Judaism today is called Rabbinic Judaism. But even though they're different, there are resemblances between the two. So we can go and look at Judaism today and see some resemblance of what was before. And now, of course, within Rabbinic Judaism, there are different options, variations. But for the most part, if we were to go to a, a synagogue service, a Jewish worship service today, this is what we would see. And tell me if this sounds familiar. There would be opening prayers and so on. And then there'd be readings from the prophets and the chanting of a psalm. And then perhaps a reading from the books of wisdom or some other part of the Old Testament. And then there is the Alleluia, and that's the big part. Alleluia, everyone stands up and everyone's singing Alleluia. It's Hebrew, it means praise God. Praise God, praise God, Alleluia, Alleluia, right? And the rabbi goes to the ark. So it's called the ark, and it's the dwelling place of the Torah. So the five first books of the Old Testament, there's the most sacred part of the Old Testament. They're contained in large scrolls, ornately decorated, huge scrolls, the Torah. And the Torah sits in the ark. It actually looks a lot like our tabernacle. And it's flanked by red candles. Because the presence of God is found in the word of God. And so the rabbi then goes up and picks up the Torah, and they're huge. He has to rest them on his shoulder, these huge scrolls. And then he begins to process through the congregation as the people are chanting and singing, Alleluia, Alleluia. And the faithful take their prayer books and they touch Torah and then they touch their heads. Right? That the wisdom of God might come into their minds and transform them. And then the rabbi comes up and proclaims the word from Torah. And then after that he gives a homily. <laughs> Does that all sound familiar? You can imagine that when we began to formalize our worship outside of the synagogue, we just took that format. So we have an Old Testament reading, a, reading, a chanting or a reading of the psalm. Then we added a New Testament letter reading. We only added that about 60 years ago. And then we have the Alleluia, right? And oftentimes here at the 11 o'clock, we actually carry the book of the Gospels. And then the book of the Gospels are carried over and there's the proclamation of the Gospel. Now when the Gospel, book is, the gospel reading is introduced, what do you do? You bless your forehead, your mouth, and your heart. Right? Rather than having you reach out with a prayer book, you're doing the same action. May divine wisdom be in my mind, on my lips, and in my heart. And then after that, there's a homily. So you can see we just took the early synagogue service and just merged it into our own worship because it's that important. So that's our history of the liturgy of the word. What's the point of the liturgy of the word? Dear friends, I think that as Catholics, what we have most lost is the sacredness and the importance of the liturgy of the word. Oftentimes, Catholics approach the liturgy of the word one step above trash or one step above some type of interlude into something else. No, the liturgy of the word stands on its own and there's power and authority that is exercised during the liturgy of the word. During the liturgy of the word, we should be careful about getting up and having needless activity. Sometimes there's so many distractions, people coming and going. My goodness, are the bathrooms closed before mass? Huh? Must we constantly go back and forth, especially during the liturgy of the word? Must there be constant activity? Have we forgotten to turn off our cell phones? Parents, have you not yet forgotten or have you forgotten or have not yet learned to use our mass training room? Must we allow children to scream and yell during the liturgy of the word? The liturgy of the word is sacred. We need to revere it. Because what's happening during the liturgy of the word? Dear friends, during the liturgy of the word, God is speaking. We're not simply having some reading of ancient poetry or even a mere reading of sacred scripture. When, reading, when the scripture is pronounced and proclaimed during, the, during worship, during the mass, God is actually speaking to us. If I go home and you go home and you study the scriptures, God speaks to us. But when we come to mass and the word is proclaimed, God is speaking directly. Once again, his words are being reintroduced to us. When we hear a reading from the Old Testament and God is speaking to Moses, God isn't just speaking to Moses. God speaking to us. When God speaks to the prophets in the scriptures, to Isaiah or Ezekiel or any of the other prophets, he's not just speaking to them. He's speaking to us. And dear friends, it is rude to speak when someone else is speaking. It is blasphemy to speak when God is speaking. 
For God, in the liturgy of the word, is speaking to his people. He has powerful words and wisdom he wants to give to us. But so oftentimes we can be so distracted. I can look out and just look at the congregation and see that the minds and the hearts of so many are somewhere else. Making their to-do list, worrying about what they're going to buy from the grocery store, or they're thinking about the passing things of this world. My goodness, give your mind and heart an hour's break. All those problems will be waiting for you after Mass. Do not waste this sacred time. There are people who can sit through the Mass, hear the proclamation of the Word, hear the homily, walk out in their car and not be able to recall not a single thing of what they heard. Because their minds and their hearts were somewhere else. God was speaking, but God's people were not listening. I want to emphasize again that God is actually speaking to us. Imagine that the ambo is a burning bush. And just as he said to Moses, take off your shoes for you are on holy ground. And God began to speak to Moses during the liturgy of the word. This ambo becomes a burning bush. God is speaking to us. Just as he spoke to Isaiah, and Isaiah said, Who am I? Who am I? I am a man of unclean lips, and I'm not worthy of your presence. Once again, God is appearing to us. He is present to us and speaking to us. And we should have that same humility, that same openness of heart and willingness to receive whatever he desires to give us. We have to pay attention. We have to know what's going on. We have to make the active choice to participate in the Mass. Let me give you an example. After the Gospel is proclaimed, and the Gospel is reserved to an ordained person, either a priest or by delegation a deacon. Have you ever noticed that before the deacon can proclaim the Gospel, I have to bless him? Because that is a priestly authority to proclaim the Gospel. And after the Gospel is proclaimed, let's see, I say to you, the Gospel of the Lord, and what do you say? Okay, now you remember, let's say it with boldness. The gospel of the Lord. Did you notice what you just said? That's what grammar calls a direct address. You didn't say, praise you, Father Kirby, that was good, right? Or, hey, good, praise you, Deacon Doc, that was great. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. That's a direct address. You are speaking to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ just spoke to you. He's not just speaking to the people of Capernaum or Jerusalem, or Nazareth, or the places of the Holy Land, during the proclamation of the Gospel, Jesus is speaking to you. So much so that when the Gospel is concluded, you acknowledge that He has just spoken to you. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You can walk from a ma outside of a Mass and say, Jesus Christ just spoke to me. I heard the powerful words of my Savior speak to me. I heard His words. Because Jesus speaks the living God speaks during the liturgy of the word. We have to claim this, dear friends. I think we have completely forgotten the power of the liturgy of the word. And I think as Christians, we need to reclaim that because we need God's divine wisdom. We need the messages that he desires to give to us. Now, we have to give due acknowledgement to our Protestant neighbors. Do you know up until the Protestant Reformation, we didn't have pews. In fact, go to our ancient churches in, uh, throughout Europe Go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, there are no pews. Do you know why? <laughs> because in ancient worship, up until the 1600s, we stood for the liturgy of the word. The people of God stood for the proclamation of the word, and you stood for the homily. And some of our early fathers, they preached for two or three hours. Huh? You think 25, 28 minutes is long, they preached for hours. And the faithful stood to show that they were ready that they received what God was, would, was saying to them, and they would, were, were going to accomplish what he asked of them. The Protestants introduced pews, and Mother Church said, you know, that's a good idea. Right? We can kind of sit down a little bit. I mention that because the pews are given to you in order for you to be more attentive. The pews are not given to you in order for you to act like you're in your living room or some park. You're not here to recline and take some time off. You are here for worship. You have work to do as a baptized Christian. And those, these pews are given to you in order for you to be relatively comfortable so you can pay attention and listen to what God is saying. So make sure you use these gifts of the pews well. Incidentally, this is why we stand for the gospel. That's a remnant of what was before. We still stand for the gospel out of reverence. 
And again, in former times, we stood through the entire liturgy of the word. You know, for the liturgy of the Eucharist, you know what we would do? We would lie prostrate. We would lie prostrate for the liturgy of the Eucharist when God truly became present under the appearance of bread and wine. Powerful, right? Now we kneel. Same act of adoration. We just need to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. During the liturgy of the word, dear friends, I want you to understand that God is speaking to you. You know, God can give one message and it's applied in hundreds of different ways. God speaks to his people and it has a different particular application in hundreds of different hearts. God can give one word today and to one heart, the message might be, be more patient and kind. To another, it might be, stand up for yourself. For another, it might be, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. Keep fighting. There are thousands of different messages that God's word can give. Do you know God wants to speak to you at every Mass? God can speak to you in thousands of different ways outside of the Mass, but none of them compete to the way that he wants to speak to you during the Mass. During the Liturgy of the Word in particular, you have to hold the posture spiritually and even with your bodies in order to hear what God is saying to you, in order to receive his wisdom. I share with you as a fellow believer, at every Mass I sit and I open my heart, I ask the Lord to speak to me. And in every single Mass, he speaks words. Sometimes they're words of consolation. It's good to go. Everything's going to be all right. With the passing of my father, I still receive consolation. I could not imagine grieving his loss without the help of the Mass and without the liturgy of the word. Lord, speak to me. I'm broken. I'm hurt. I miss him so much. Please help me. And the Lord speaks to me and heals me. Sometimes they're words of correction. You can do better, Kirby. Straighten up. Get your act together. Stop being a jerk. Huh? Sometimes it's words of wisdom. Don't do this, do this. He will tell me, you've made the wrong decision. Change it. So you see, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. God's word is living and active, alive among God's people. We have to pay attention. We have to understand what God is saying. Sometimes it grieves me when I hear a fellow believer say, I don't understand what you mean God speaks to you. What do you mean God speaks to you? What are you, crazy? And it just shows that they have a closed heart that they don't understand, that their heart has become calloused. No, dear friends, we have to open up our heart because God is speaking to his people. And God has powerful message, he, messages he wants to give to us every day. But we have to humble ourselves, calm our spirits, open our hearts, and allow him to speak. And God will speak to you. If there are questions you have right now in your own faith, or concerns, anxieties, if perhaps your own heart is grieving or hurt, God has messages of hope, reconciliation, love, healing, power, that he wants to give to you. God is speaking, dear friends. The only question is whether God's people are listening. And that's the work of the liturgy of the word. So that's the part of the mass we're gonna be walking through the next couple of weeks. And I'm excited to walk through that with you. Now let's shift a little bit to the catechism of the Catholic Church. If you have your catechisms, you can join me in number 1341. So number 1341, we're continuing to walk through the catechism, it's part on the Eucharist. Now, as a review, and I know some of you are thinking, perhaps, oh my goodness, we do this every week. Why do you keep doing this? Well, do you know why I keep asking these questions, Team Grace? Because in two years, three years, four years, if someone asks you these questions, I want you to be able to give an answer. I want to make sure that you understand the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that you're reading it and trying to understand the truths of our faith. So let me ask you, Team Grace, how many main parts are there in the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Bravo. You know, isn't it sad, Teen Grace, that the majority of Catholics do not even know that there is a catechism of the Catholic Church? Not only do you know that there's a catechism, you know the structure of the catechism. What's the first part? The creed. The second? Sacraments. The third? Morals. The fourth? Prayer. You know, someone reached out to me, a fellow parisher, and she was sharing with me. She said, Father, I tried to start reading part one. Oof, Father, it was hard. And in some places, it was dry. I said, I'll go one step further. Not only was it dry, but in some places, it's just downright boring. <laughs> There's some really deep theology. There's some very specifics about who Jesus Christ is that are important, but sometimes they don't have a whole lot of application in our lives. So I told this fellow parishioner, I said, well, just stop part reading part one. Go to part four. This is what I love, part four on prayer. How we can talk to God, how we can hear when he speaks to us, how we can discern what he's asking of us. I love part four. Go to part four. She said, wait a minute, you mean I can just go to part four? I said, yeah, there's no rule. You have to start at the beginning of part one and walk all the way through. You can go to part four, especially if that's going to motivate you and help you be a better disciple. And get this, Team Grace, you don't, you don't even have to read a whole part. 
You can just bounce through the catechism however you need to. The most important thing is that you're actually reading the catechism and seeking to know the truths of faith. So let's go then to number 1341. It reads, The command of Jesus to repeat his actions and words until he comes does not only ask us to remember Jesus and what he did. So here the catechism is making an important point. In English, this is difficult because recall and remember are practically synonyms in English. It means they mean about the same thing in popular speech. But in Hebrew and Greek, they're very different words, very different concepts. Recall is two plus two equals four. Oh, recall is your name is Joe, your name is Sally. That's recall, just recalling information. Remember is very different. A remembering is actually reliving something. Right? So imagine if someone would run up here and grab and then pull off my arm, right? They've dismembered me, huh? And then I go to the hospital and the doctors put the arm back on, they have remembered me, right? Something that was a part of me that was forgotten but has then been brought back. Right? So a remembering, a reliving. The catechism is telling us, Jesus didn't say in the upper room, hey, when you guys think about it, maybe think of me every once in a while, or, you know, like, maybe just recall a few things I've done. No, Jesus is, the command we receive is to remember. The catechism continues. Jesus is passing over to the Father by his death and resurrection, excuse me, correction. It is directed to the liturgical celebration by the apostles and their successors of the memorial of Christ, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection, of his intercession in the presence of the Father. So there the catechism actually italicizes the word memorial. And that's difficult because we can look at that word in English and think we know what it means. But it's italicized here to let us know that it's actually an English translation of deeper Hebrew and and, and, uh, Greek concepts. So here the catechism is emphasizing we are remembering the memorial. We are reliving what was done in the past. It is powerful that Jesus would give us the new and eternal covenant during the Passover. During the Passover celebration, have you read this in the Old Testament? During the Passover celebration, God's people actually had to dress the part. You'll read in the Old Testament, God says to his people, when you celebrate the Passover, grandpa or the oldest male member of the family is to sit in his loincloth. That's awkward. (laughs) Loincloth means underwear, okay? Don't need grandpa sitting around his underwear, right? Grandpa is to sit in his underwear with his staff and tell the children the story of the Passover. The food is not to be fully cooked. Some of it's not cooked at all. The bread is not to be leavened. To this day, we still use unleavened bread for the sacrifice. All these things were done because the people were reminded that God ransomed his people. He did it quickly. He did it swiftly. God told his people, get out of Egypt now. Go, go. Pharaoh's coming. Go. They had to move quickly. So the food wasn't even far properly prepared. The, the bread had not yet been leavened. They weren't even able to be fully clothed. They had to go. Generations afterwards, hundreds and thousands of years after the historical event of Passover, God tells his people, no, you're going to dress the part. I don't want the food to be cooked. I don't want the bread to be leavened. And I want to make sure you dress as if you're in a hurry. God was showing them that he was going to relive for them what was done for their ancestors in previous generations. So when you celebrated Passover, you were there. You were at the Exodus. You were able to see the liberation of God's people from the slavery of Egypt. Jesus chose the Passover in order to give us the new and eternal covenant, the new and eternal sacrifice, to show us that at every Mass, when we do this in remembrance of him, we are reliving the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are there at Calvary. When we come to the Mass and we offer the sacrifice, we are there. Our Lady, St. John, they are there with us at Calvary. We are reliving, remembering the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. And Teen Grace, that's just number 1341. (laughs) You see how much wisdom is contained in the Catechism? And why it's so important that we study and know the Catechism? Dear friends, we're going to continue to walk through this ordinary time. We're going to go through the different parts of the Mass And we're going to continue to walk through the catechism of the Catholic Church. Why? Because I want to make sure as your pastor and fellow believer that you are well formed. That you are intentional disciples. That you understand what the Lord Jesus is asking of us. And that you both worship him in spirit and truth. And that you then leave this sacred place and fulfill his commands and teach all nations. That whatever you do, 
and wherever God's providence might lead you, that you will know of his presence with you and the mission that has been entrusted to you, and you'll seek to do it faithfully, to do what the Lord says, to do all that he asks of you.